key controversies of the Korean War, to go or not to go over the 38th parallel. So the knowledge, should the US go over the 38th parallel? And what were the consequences of the Chinese intervention in the Korean War? The skill you'll be using will be reading with purpose and note-taking. The outcomes will be that you will have a table with reasons for and against going over the 38th parallel. You will have used that evidence to come to a decision about what the United States would do, and you will have a list of reasons why the Chinese intervened in the war. The decision then to move north of the 38th parallel. Read through the paragraphs below and answer the following questions. Did the Chinese give any warning that they might intervene in the Korean War? And secondly, what reasons are there for US involvement over the 38th parallel? The risk of China's involvement in Korea. There were clearly risks involved in moving into North Korea. The greatest danger was that it would provoke the Chinese into intervening. There were already large numbers of Chinese divisions in Manchuria, just north of the Yalu River, that marked the border. To occupy the whole of Korea would bring the US forces to the Yalu River and in the northeast to the border with the Soviet Union. On October the 1st, some Republic of Korea units crossed the 38th parallel into North Korea. On October the 2nd, at midnight, Chow and Lai, the Chinese Prime Minister, suddenly summoned the Indian ambassador in Beijing to tell him that if US forces crossed the border, China would be forced to intervene. The Chinese hoped that India would pass the message to the United States, since there were no direct diplomatic links between the People's Republic of China and the United States. Unfortunately, the US State Department did not take the warning seriously. MacArthur was convinced that the Chinese would not intervene and was determined to complete his triumph of Incheon by rolling back communism from North Korea. He enjoyed enormous support from within the United States from the general public and in particular from the China lobby, who actually welcomed a conflict with Mao's China, hoping it would see the return of Chiang Kai-shek and a reversal of what they saw as the humiliating defeat of 1949. The American decision to invade North Korea in the circumstances of 1950, it is not difficult to see why Truman and the State Department found it impossible to resist the pressure to invade the North. Militarily, it made little sense to stop at the arbitrary line of the 38th parallel. It was thought far better to push on and, with, eliminate the threat from the North totally, or at least find a better defensive line further north on which to dig in and defend. Morally, they felt that the Soviet Union had lost credibility and destroyed the sanctity of the 1945 agreements by sanctioning and encouraging Kim's assault. In other words, they started it, so they must now take the consequences and accept the loss of North Korea from their sphere of influence. Within the State Department, the moderates, such as George Kennan, who saw the Soviet Union as badly behaved but containable, were being replaced by more aggressive Cold War warriors like Dean Rusk, John Allison, and John Foster Dulles. To this new group, it was essential to respond to challenges from Moscow with a hard-hitting response in order to discourage such adventures. There was a growing anti-communist lobby in the United States, but most notably enshrined in the singularly unpleasant and unprincipled figure of Joe McCarthy. But even moderate Republicans were pressing for a tougher line on Moscow. Public opinion seemed to be behind this tougher stance, and opinion polls indicated that 64% of American citizens favoured invading the North. Since congressional elections were due in November, it is little wonder that Truman and Acheson found it almost impossible to resist the pressure to cross the 38th parallel, although they indicated in the orders issued to MacArthur that he should show restraint. He was not to undertake any act which risked extending the war into conflict either with China or the Soviets. U.S. troops were not to be used near the border. Despite these warnings, the orders given to the Supreme Commander were ambiguous, and knowing MacArthur's tendency to interpret any order in a way that suited him, they offered little real restraint. Should the U.S. move north of the 38th parallel? Your task, draw and complete the table presented below in your exercise book after reading through the sources. Work your way through each of the sources and complete the following two columns. Evidence that they suggest containment was the appropriate policy or that rollback, pushing the North Koreans out of the Korean Peninsula, was the appropriate policy. In conclusion, based on the evidence in these sources, 
should the US go over the 38th parallel? Explain your answer. Source A, Ambassador George Kennan to Truman, 23rd of August 1950. I would not tolerate that communist control should be extended to South Korea, since this would have damaged our prestige in Asia. Nevertheless, it is not essential to us to see an anti-Soviet Korean regime extended to all of Korea for all time. It is impossible to keep Korea permanently out of Soviet influence. Source B, the National Security Council, reports to Truman, September the 9th, 1950. The political objective of the UN in Korea is about to bring about the complete independence and unity of Korea. If the present UN action in Korea can accomplish this without sustainably increasing the risk of a general war with the Soviet Union or Communist China, we should support it. Source C. CIA report, September the 27th, 1950. There are no convincing indications of an actual Chinese communist intention to result to full-scale intervention in Korea. While full-scale Chinese communist intervention in North Korea must be regarded as con a continuing possibility, a consideration of all known factors leads to the conclusion that barring a Soviet decision for global war, such action is not probable in 1950. There will be no Soviet or Chinese communist intervention in Korea. Source D, UN Resolution, October the 7th, 1950. The UN recommends that all appropriate steps be taken to ensure conditions of stability throughout Korea. Source E, Radio Peking, October the 10th, 1950. The American War of Intervention in Korea has been a serious menace to the security of China from the very start. The Chinese people cannot stand idly by with regard to such a serious situation. The Chinese people firmly advocate a peaceful resolution to the Korean problem and are firmly opposed to the extension of the Korean War by America. Source F. Edexcel Ideology Conflict and Retreat, the USA in Asia, 2009. Even apart from the possibility of Chinese intervention, there were real problems of supply and communication in invading North Korea. Winter was approaching and subarctic temperatures of minus 30 degrees Celsius were likely. Roads were few and the country was divided by a central mountainous spine which could divide the forces. In the west under Walker from the 10th Corps and in the east under Armand, MacArthur brushed aside all problems insisting that North Koreans were beaten and that the Chinese would not intervene. He was badly served by his head of intelligence, Major General Willoughby. Willoughby knew what MacArthur wanted to be told and made sure the intelligence fitted the bill. The number of Chinese troops in Manchuria was persistently underestimated, as was their quality. To MacArthur, the war was nearly over, apart from a parade to the Yalu River. The impact of China's involvement in the war. MacArthur ordered his, troop, his ground commanders to advance to the Yalu. On the 1st and 2nd of November, as if from nowhere, a large force of Chinese troops struck an elite force of troops at Unsan, 50 miles south of the border. They inflicted a terrible battering on the Americans and swept away several South Korean units on their flanks. Over 150,000 troops had crossed into Korea, and Willoughby's intelligence knew nothing of it. Attacks were also launched on Armand's force in the east, which the Marines beat off but took casualties. As you read through this section, list the reasons for Chinese intervention. China's intervention was of massive significance. There was a real possibility of it triggering a Third World War, which could be the world's first nuclear war. Such an eventuality was avoided, but it was, at the very least, ended dreams of a reunited Korea and ensure the war would drag on until 1953. Why did the Chinese intervene? The decision to intervene was not taken lightly by the Chinese Politburo. China was ravaged by years of warfare and the Chinese Communist regime still struggled to assert its authority and control, particularly in the south. Chiang Kai-shek had withdrawn to Taiwan with a formidable army and this was the priority target for most of the Chinese leadership. The USA seemed to have abandoned Chiang until North Korea struck south. At this point, Truman reversed US policy and sent the US 7th Fleet to patrol between Thailand, Taiwan and the mainland making a communist invasion impossible. Stalin pressed the Chinese to assist Kim, but it was plain that direct Soviet intervention was out of the question. The best, 
that he could hope for was air cover, which Stalin promised. Mao rec could recognize the arguments for intervention. He did not want to hostile U.S. forces on the border with Chinese Manchuria, where most of China's limited industry was concentrated. This industry depended in part on electricity generated by hydroelectric power in North Korea. Furthermore, Mao could see that the conflict could heighten nationalist sentiment in China behind the new regime, helping him to sweep away enemies and impose his program of reform. He was also very conscious of Chinese history as it had for his hero, the first emperor of China, a successful foreign adventure could consolidate Mao's power and prestige. The first Qin emperor had invaded Vietnam in the 3rd century BC. For Mao, the, that other traditional tributary of China would do, Korea. Mao appears to have had a hard time convincing his Politburo colleagues. The obvious choice to command the armies, Lin Biao, a hero of the civil war fighting in Manchuria, refused to support the war. Chow and Lai, the Prime Minister, was half-hearted, but he learned not to oppose Mao directly. Mao's greatest ally proved to be China's other greatest soldier, Peng Duhai. He supported intervention and was appointed to command the 300,000 troops that China began to assemble on the Korean border. The decision was taken in October to intervene since the US had crossed the 38th parallel. The Dragon Attacks Take note. What factors made it possible for Chinese forces to reach Seoul? Draw a diagram with, in January 1951, the Chinese occupied Seoul in the circle. Place your factors around the circle, adding key points to show their significance. Draw arrows to indicate links between them and to, st and to the statement in the centre. Label the arrows to explain the links you have made. The Chinese armies now poised on the border of North Korea were very different to those from the USA. They were essentially tough but lightly armed infantry. They were not limited to the roads, having little mechanical transport. Their artillery could not match that of the states, and they relied largely on rifles, machine gun and mortars. There was little Soviet air support, despite Mao's hopes of Stalin's promises. The Chinese troops were, however, masters of camouflage and of the surprise attack. Clad in quilted cotton jackets and light shoes, they could move quickly through difficult terrain. They appreciated the importance of air power and their lack of it, and therefore moved mostly at night, often launching their attacks in the hours of darkness. They lacked modern methods of communication, namely radios, and relied on what were to Western ears a weird collection of sounds to convey orders. The noise from trumpets, gongs, and other musical instruments filled the air and often caused the hair on the back of Western necks to stand up. In short, two alien cultures confronted each other. By mid-November, between 120 and 150,000 troops confronted Armand's 10th Corps in the east, and considerably more than this, in excess of 200,000, faced Walker's 8th Army in the west. The rap was about to be sprung. Armand, echoing MacArthur's confidence and believing Willoughby's low estimates, urged the Marine Division north up an 80-mile single-track road to the Chosan Reservoir near the border. The Marine's commander suspected a trap as a crucial bridge over a chasm had not been blown up by retreating communist forces, but he reluctantly obeyed orders and advanced his highly trained 20,000 men northward into the icy hills. On the 25th of November, the Chinese offensive against Walker in the west began near the town of Kunuri. The UN front collapsed. South Korean units broke and fled, and the US forces faced being totally surrounded. The decision was taken to retreat. Thus, the longest retreat in US military history began, 300 miles in total. Units pulled back with increasing rapidity. Morale plummeted and it became increasingly impossible to think of making a stand to halt the Chinese advance. In the east it looked as if a bigger disaster was brewing. The attack there began two days later on the 27th of November. By this time nearly 100,000 veterans had circled the Marine Corps, blocking its retreat from the Chosin Reservoir. In this case, the encirclement failed and the Marines proceeded to blast their way down the road they had only two weeks before advanced up. It was a feat of tight discipline and incredible firepower. When asked if he was retreating, the US Marine commander replied that he was merely advancing in a different direction. The Chinese now blew the bridge over the chasm to halt the US Marines, but bridging equipment was flown in from Japan and guns and tanks and vehicles and all sorts passed down the road to the port of Hongham. Armand's whole corps then embarked with little loss of men, equipment, or even accompanying civilian refugees. It was a triumph of naval and air power. 
it was impossible to remain in the northeast as the western front had collapsed, and even MacArthur had to accept the logic of this, although blaming others for the disaster. The northern capital of Pyongyang was abandoned and thousands of tons of straws destroyed. On the 23rd of December, Walker was killed in a road accident. His replacement was Matthew Ridgway, an eminent paratroop commander, and although he could not instantly stop the retreat, he first slowed it and began to restore morale. Nevertheless, Seoul was lost for the second time, and it was not until some 50 miles to the south that the Chinese were finally halted. They had outrun their supplies and were hungry, frozen, and pounded from the air by a massively superior U.S. air power. In this way, the Great Retreat came to an end in February 1951. Intervention in North Korea had taken a terrible toll on Chinese lives. The appalling firepower of a unit like the Marine Division impressed Pang, who became much more cautious than Kim Il-sung or Mao. In March, Ridgway was able to launch an offensive which pushed the communists' forces back and recaptured Seoul. MacArthur flew into Korea to take the limelight and claimed that he had, only, he had ordered the offensive, which in reality he had had little to do with. The truth was that MacArthur was not only irritating Ridgway, he was increasingly infuriating Washington. <laughs>